so uh, we what we know uh, there were a lot of uh, that you can show there were many people who had shown up at the uh, polls uh, during this uh, referendum and as well uh, it was a lot about the emotions but the polls are already closed uh, while we also uh, the polls are already closed but there is no results because uh, there is no exit poll as usually due to the cost constraint so the results could be uh, announced in an hour but with the condition if there is a clear difference between four uh, percent more than uh percent between yes and no and that 10 percent of the ballots from the entire country will be count would be counted now as we mentioned we want to give this issue a little bit more of a focus the issue of course is not just greece though that's an important issue it's the question of what sort of an effect this could have on other economies in the region now whether or not that's italy or spain countries that are also dealing with large debt loads or countries like ukraine where the finance minister yoresco had said that it's within the realm of possibility that ukraine could default in july and all of these markets are connected they affect how countries are able to borrow what or international organizations or wealthier countries are willing to give, and that's something we wanted to pay a little bit more attention to. Uh, for that, we wanted to go to Skype. Now we're going to be joined by uh, Yuri uh, uh, Horodnichenko, who is an associate professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and also on the editorial board of Vox Ukraine. Uh, Yuri, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So, I mean, being uh, an economist, what, what's really at stake with this referendum today in Greece? Well, as you know, there was a period of difficult negotiations between uh, the Greek government and uh, its creditors. The situation reached an impossible and no party can uh, make progress. Uh, they couldn't accept uh, you know, what was offered by the other party, and there had to be a breakthrough, and this referendum is a way to strengthen the position of the Greek government. Okay. And I mean, when we're looking at the broader implications, what can this mean, you know, for countries like Italy and Spain and others in the Eurozone that are dealing with debts, and then more broadly for countries like Ukraine? Well, so for countries in uh, Southern Europe, uh, Italy, Spain, I mean, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, development what happens in Greece now. If Greece defaults on its debt, there will be a lot of pressure on governments in this country, so it's something similar. You can liberate the country from this burden. And uh, if Greece was successful at doing that, then uh, this country should do the same. So there's a potential for a domino effect there. So if Greece were successful with this, you know, it doesn't leave the Eurozone, that other countries might try and do the same? It's a possibility. I don't think it's going to happen because what happens in Greece now is very problematic. Nobody wants to have uh, economic problems uh, in those countries. And plus, you know, the situation in Italy, Spain, and Portugal is not as desperate as it is in Greece. For example, in Greece, the unemployment rate is 25% or something like that. In other countries, it is significantly less. In Portugal, it's probably only half of that. Um, so, you know, they're watching this very carefully, and this is part of why they doesn't want to forgive uh, the debt of Greece, because then um, parties uh, in Italy, Spain, and Portugal that promise to get a back again from the EU, they may be moved into the office. And then again, you can have another referendum in Italy, in Spain, in mm -hmm. Portugal. This is why the EU treads the very, very carefully. Okay. And currently in Ukraine, there are many people who comparing the situation in the both countries with the economy on the edge, with the possibilities of the default. So what are the similarities? What are the differences? And what are the lessons for Ukraine as well? That's, that's a great question. What is the lesson of what happens in Greece uh, for Ukraine? I think it's going to have a very limited impact on what happens in Ukraine. Uh, in a way, what bad things that can happen already happen in Ukraine. For example, the banking system is already uh, kind of under uh, sort of support from the central bank. Uh, Ukraine already had a major devaluation of Greece. It doesn't have that. Uh, we Ukraine cannot borrow in private markets, Greece is not going to be able to borrow in private markets. So in a way, we already have the point that Greece is going to, to take. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think there is any direct impact on the collapse of the Greek economy or the Ukrainian economy. As I said, Ukraine does not borrow in the private markets, so it's extremely unlikely we have any sort like a run of Ukrainian uh, public debt. Uh, our banking systems are entirely disconnected. Uh, our trade is very limited, maybe 
percent, maybe a fraction of one percent of uh, Ukraine's uh, external trade exports is, is directed to Greece. So even if the whole Greek economy collapses, well, we, we will feel very well. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying, that they're too different, but, and what is the current economic situation in Ukraine like? Because we've had the finance minister, Yaresko, she'd said things, you know, admitted to journalists that a default for Ukraine is within the realm of possibility. So, I mean, how close is that possibility, and what would, how would a Ukrainian default differ from a Greek default if it were to come that far? All right, so the main difference is that in, in Ukraine, uh, the banking system is already insulated from the default. Uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, in, the, in Ukraine, the banking system is insulated from the default. In Greece, it's not true. The Greek bank very much depends on emergency funding from the European Central Bank. If Greece will snow and the European market is empty, uh, it will be no then you have to exit the Eurozone. It means the Greek banks cannot obtain funding, emergency funding from the ECB, and then the whole banking system is going to collapse. Ukraine does not depend on any external funding from anybody else. They get their funding from the National Bank of Ukraine. And so, so in this sense, even if Ukraine defaults, we're not going to see any sort of uh, what we see in Greece potentially. And in this sense, the cost of default in Ukraine is significantly lower than it is in, in, in Greece. And just um, very shortly, if you can explain for us who are not that well aware of the economy, so if there would be the results uh, with uh, Greece uh, voters uh, saying no, I mean, what would be an impact for the financial system for the, I understand it's all very much unpredictable, uh, we don't want to speculate, but still, what would it mean? Right, so I think it will actually have relatively little impact. In 2010, when Greece was approaching default very, very seriously, very closely, that was an extremely dangerous point because uh, German banks, French banks had an exposure to Greek debt. Now, almost all of the Greek debt is owned by, by the other governments, by Germany, by Iran, uh, by uh, France. And so, in a way, if Greece says, okay, we're going to wipe out our debt. The only effect it's going to have is the sort of taxpayers' money in other countries. And so, in this sense, the domino effect now is going to be much more contained. Maybe there will be some implications for other countries, but relative to what would have happened, say, five years ago, it's going to be very moderate. And when we're looking at countries' economies, I mean, particularly after, you know, periods where there's a lot of debt, how does sovereign debt, uh, you know, that a country has differ from a debt that a person has, and how are the solutions different there? Yes, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, countries are, in many ways, very different from individuals. Um, for example, if you think about the court system in the U.S. or in Ukraine, you can declare bankruptcy, and um, at some point, People cannot pursue, your creditors cannot pursue you in courts uh, uh, to recover uh, potential assets you may have. With well, countries, it's a little different because countries in the Tory were in principle, only creditors go to international courts and try to confiscate the property if you have a home. If you have a building in the US, they can confiscate this in the US. Now, I don't think it's going to be a problem for Greece specifically, especially for Ukraine, because these countries have relatively little assets, relatively few assets abroad, and so on. Uh, it may be a very lengthy process, but uh, it's it not like, you know, it just seems like one of the big issues is not just dealing with debt, it's about how to get the economy going again. And so where the idea for a person is to you know, limit what they're spending so that they're able to keep more back, pay off debts, where with governments, you're, it's much more important that they're able to put enough money into the economy to get it going and even to get it kick-starting, because that increases tax revenue, it does all of that. But that seems to be a big difference between Northern and Southern Europe, the way that they approach this issue. Right, so, you know, when you default, Resources you don't have to pay your creditors. Um, I don't think any of us going to be a big deal in Greece because so now Greece is paying very, very low interest rate on its debt. And so the flow cost of getting that is not going to be very big for Greece now. If they default, they free up a little bit of resources and um, uh, it, it may help, but the cost of doing this is, is as much higher because they lose access to the same emergency funding from the European Central Bank. In Ukraine, on the other hand, it's a little different because we actually pay a lot in, in, uh, in interest.
is still very less than the percent of GDP, and that's much, much, much higher than in free space. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for that information. Thank you. Okay. And uh, we are also very happy to have here in our studio Alexander Motil, who is a professor in political science at Rutgers University in New York in the States, and is Ukrainian, and is for many years uh, researching on the empires, on the Russian empire, on Ukraine, and writing a lot on this region. So good maybe, evening. <laughs> good evening, thanks. For my pleasure. Maybe the first question, just to kind of get things rolling, you've been back in Kiev and Ukraine for a little while now. Was it three weeks or? Three weeks, yes. So what's your impression of reforms? What's the, what have people been telling you? How are you evaluating the spirit here? Especially why we talk about Greece and all this economic collapse as, you know, everybody's concerned. Well, you talk to people in Ukraine, as you well know, and everyone will tell you that there's no reform, that the country is at a dead end, and it's virtually on the verge of collapse. Um, and I know from my own research and from my own writings, as well as from observing things, that that's just not the case. I mean, Ukraine has embarked on reforms. They may be inadequate. They may be too slow. I mean, that, those are fair accusations. But the standard Ukrainian perception that nothing has changed, quote, unquote, uh, is simply wrong. But it's understandable, because people's lives have gotten more difficult. And what they expect from reform is an immediate improvement in their material existence. So what have been the key reforms for you that have happened here so far? Well, for instance, I mean, something in the nature of macroeconomic stabilization has actually taken place. And I don't want to go into that too far, because I base my analysis on people like Professor Gorodnichenko and the Vox Ukraine team, but they're pretty clear. Clearly something has happened and it's of a positive nature. Uh, Ukraine has fulfilled most of the requirements of the International Monetary Fund. Again, this is according to the statistical surveys that Vox Ukraine as well as Ukrainska Pravda have performed. I'm impressed by some of the changes that have taken place in the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Just today, as you know, there is a new police force in Kiev. I'm impressed by the depth and extent and wisdom of the education reforms that have been embarked upon. I'm impressed by the fact that Ukraine finally has an army. It never had an army, at least not for the last 25 years. It has an army. It has something resembling a national policy, a national security policy. It has a fairly coherent foreign policy. Um, in other words, things have changed. I mean, a significant number of things have changed fairly significant. So, well then, but it also matters because when you speak to the people in the streets, they are unsatisfied. So there is some gap. And so what is the problem then? Because there is a growing dissatisfaction, uh, not by everybody, of course, uh, but still. So what is missing then? Well, there are two things. I mean, one is the, the superficial answer, but not an incorrect superficial answer to your question, is the government isn't doing a good enough job in communicating the changes that it's brought about. Um, I'm impressed by the way Saakashvili is able to reach out to the population of Odessa, is re able to reach out to the armed forces and persuade them that he's on their side and that he's doing things to help them. Well, and he'll take journalists with him while he's doing it and, you know, really get out there, be on social media, be on Facebook. Exactly. So he's that. savvy. He understands how these mm -hmm. things are done. And I'm... I'm somewhat at a loss to explain why Poroshenko, Yatsenyuk, or some of the other ministers aren't doing similar kinds of outreach efforts. But the more serious response to your question is that change is always painful, and significant change is especially painful. Ukraine has to experience very significant change, and for that change to have a positive effect, that will take time. It always does. It might be half a year, it might be a year, it might be a little more than that. But the immediate consequence of any kind of change is always a reduction in efficiency, is a reduction in well-being. And when people have exalted expectations, as they rightly do because of the Maidan and the revolution, and the result is a 
seeming de well, a real decline in their living standards, rightly, they are upset. And they're asking themselves, well, where is the change? There doesn't seem to be any. But of course, there is. But it's institutional. It's structural. It's well, I mean, And that's, that's the disconnect. I mean, having been in a lot of villages and small towns lately, you talk to people whose salary a month now is barely over $100, where unemployment benefits, I think, are about $40 a month. And what people can buy with their income is also significantly limited. And of course, for them, the question is, how has anything gotten better? How are we moving ahead? So, I mean, what, what do you tell to those people? I mean, I understand the basic argument, I think, is this is an investment in the future. This is necessary to move ahead. But it also seems like in Ukraine's history, there have been so many moments when things have gotten worse, but then failed to get better. Yeah, that's right. I mean, again, it's perfectly reasonable and logical for people to have the expectation that this is just another one of those moments. Uh, and that they're being promised all sorts of positive changes, which will never happen. So I understand them. Uh, what do you do? Well, I mean, one of the things that the government has done, again, I'm not sure how well that's working, is this program of social assistance. In other words, people who aren't going to be able to meet the, uh, the raises, rises in, in gas and electricity will be able to apply and get social assistance. That is critical. That has to work. At this point in time, that's not quite yet critical because, of course, gas and electricity expenses are down. Once November, December roll along, it is absolutely essential that the vast majority, or at least the majority of people in need, will be getting some kind of social assistance to meet those needs. If that doesn't happen, then, of course, uh, we can probably expect some unrest. I mean, how serious will the unrest be is hard to say. Uh, but certainly there will be, and, and, but certainly there will be a further decline in the legitimacy and the popularity of the government. Well, and it seems to feed a populist trend in Ukrainian politics as well. I mean, when you have people that don't have this income, uh, it makes it harder. And there's been a lot of criticism for that. You had the law passed uh, this week in concerning, you know, uh, loans that had been calculated in foreign currencies and then requiring the bank system to use the conversion that was present at that time. I mean, that seems like pure populism and certainly not of good course. economics. Yeah, that's just going to bankrupt the state. Um, I mean, I, there were a lot of young MPs who also had voted. They called their votes back, but still, they were the graduates from LSE, from the Cambridge. Still, they voted. They were in this, you know, general idea of populism. And that, of course, is the danger. I mean, and you, you know, it has to be resisted. Unfortunately, again, that means that the government, at least for the foreseeable future, let's say for the next six to twelve months. Again, I'm assuming a relatively decent, normal government. Let's assume that it's actually doing. What it thinks is correct. Uh, it will have to stick to this hard line while, of course, at the same time providing social assistance to the neediest. It will make the government extremely unpopular. Yet Sunyuk was right a year ago when he said that his government, his cabinet, would be a kamikaze cabinet. I mean, well, he was wrong in the sense that that didn't quite happen, but he's right in the sense that that has to happen. If you're going to implement reform, you will be detested. And he's succeeding. I mean, he's polling at about 1.6 percent now, I think, when he won over 20 percent in the exactly. last election. Well, maybe to turn into a, a different direction, we always find it interesting what uh, people have done research and what they've worked on before Maidan and all of that. And one of your studies had been looking at Russia and Putin's attempt to build up an authoritarian system and now uh, seems to have done that quite well. I mean, what, what was your experience working on that project and then seeing what Putin has gone on to do more recently? And maybe I should also um, jump in to say there were some articles you were writing about coming author uh, growing authoritarian Authoritarianism. Authoritarianism in Russia, even like using the words like fascism a couple of years ago, sure. that was something we never discussed. Well, back in 2006, 2007, and I forget exactly why, but I remember that I was, cons I was writing, I was thinking about what the Soviet, what the Russian regime was like. What was the best way to characterize it? You may recall there used to be debates in the early 2000s about whether this was Putinism, managed democracy, or things of that sort. And I started looking at Russia comparatively, and as I say, compared to other societies and other states historically. And it occurred to me, uh, it was one of these epiphanies, that it was decidedly similar to Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. 
And I began exploring that somewhat more closely, both conceptually, theoretically, methodologically. I won't bore you with the details, but the bottom line was that already in 2007, 2008, I started writing articles suggesting that Russia was no longer just authoritarian. Mm -hmm. It was already that, but it was moving in the direction of being a full-fledged fascist system. And what does that mean? Because that's a term we hear so right. much now, applied to Ukraine and others. So what, what is it, that? It's virtually meaningless because, of course, people by fascism, people mean, you know, bad guy. You know, right. I don't like him, so he's a fascist. He's a jerk. He's a he's fascist. He's a jerk and he's yeah. a fascist. No, I mean, you, you know, there's an entire literature on this. Uh, essentially, all right, according to my definition, to put it simply, a fascist system is a highly authoritarian state with a macho style leader. Mm -hmm. All right, that's the difference. Okay, so uh, now you can add any number of other things, but again, I won't go into the details here, but it's a highly authoritarian state with a leader who isn't just a patriarch, a general, a famous individual, a cabal, a junta, as Putin occasionally says. No, he's a leader who, gen who, who tries to project vigor, masculinity, a macho presence. We saw that with Hitler. We saw that most of all with Mussolini. We've seen that with other fascist type leaders like Juan Perón in Argentina. And we see this now in the case of Putin. Why do they do this? Because the vigor, the masculinity is a way of legitimizing themselves. It's a way of reaching out to the population appealing to the population's you know, desire for a strong man on a horseback, on horseback, and thereby acquiring that popular support. And that's exactly what Putin has done. In 2007, he was only in the process of formulating that macho image. Mm -hmm. Now it is full-fledged, which is why then I used to say it's a fascist toyed system. Now it's a fascist system. And I don't mean that they're bad guys, although they are bad guys. I mean that it's a peculiar kind of political system. How do you get out of that? If you speak about the society living in 2015, we understand that media, you, you know, they can be used in a different way. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have many media and what could be possible, you know, in history can be repeated. So what is the key thing, if to be very short, to kind of go out of that um, idea which we currently have in our neighbor country? Well, the, the main problem is that this particular fascist system, I mean, in and of itself, fascism is a problem for Russians. It's less of a problem for the neighbors. But this particular fascist system emerged on the wreckage, on the ruins of a collapsed empire. And what Putin is also doing is, in addition to having built a fascist system, he is trying to revive the kind of imperial glory that used to be Russia's in Soviet times. And in that sense, the comparison between Putin and Mr. Hitler is very appropriate. Again, and I'm not just saying that in order to uh, criticize Putin, it really is a historically and politically, a political science comparison that's very accurate. But, and that's the problem for Ukraine, because of course, we see that in the Crimea, we see that in the Donbas. That's not Putin's response to NATO aggression. It's Putin's response both to the Maidan and it's a response to his own systemic needs to expand his imperial rule. But how do you walk that tightrope, basically? Because on the one hand, there are the formal similarities in the structure of a regime, a structure of a government. You can compare something you know, to the language Putin used in taking over to Crimea, to the language Germany used, for example, in taking the Sudetenland, where they kind of played up this oppressed minority that they had to save. And there are similarities like that. But there are also, there are also people who would say, like, look, you know, millions of people were killed by Hitler, millions of Jews, all of that. How can you compare? You know, people look at the final results of the Nazi regime. And then when you look at something that's earlier along, and doesn't have that same effect. I mean, is it fair to compare those? Some people are very offended by that. Well, right, we, I mean, well they should be offended because, of course, what this me I mean, if, you, if by that you mean Russians and people who support the Russian regime, I mean, they should be offended because, of course, it's bringing to light a very unpleasant reality, one that they've generally tended to ignore. I mean, people tend to view Putin as a relatively benign dictator who has quirks. The fact of the matter is that he may actually be an individual who resembles Hitler far more so than anybody else. You may recall, by the way, um, his spokesman in New York, a man by the name of Andranik Migranyan, wrote a notorious piece about a year ago where he compared positively, he positively compared Putin to the good Hitler. And by the good Hitler, he meant the Hitler before 1939, the one who
of a strong state, repressing his opponents, and embarking on some imperial projects. Mm -hmm. The problem is, of course, that we don't know what Putin will do. Will he embark on World War III as Hitler embarked on World War II? We don't know. We hope that he won't. The point of a comparison such as this is to suggest that there are sufficient, there's a sufficiently large number of points of identity, including the seizure of Crimea, including the attempt to seize the Donbass and create a Novorossiya, to suggest that a further continued Russian expansion, whether into Ukraine or into Estonia, Latvia, or elsewhere, is, alas, perfectly possible. So that mean, now, will it happen? Well, that partly depends on what Ukraine does, partly depends on what the Baltic states do, it partly depends on what NATO does, and it depends on what the West does. I mean, nothing is inevitable, but there are certain tendencies that are pushing Russia in that direction, and it's therefore imperative for the West to say, no, you can't do this, which it did not in the case of Hitler, as you know. Hmm. And um, another very hot discussion, uh, which you mentioned in your article, uh, which you've written recently, we uh, named should Kyiv blockade the Donbass enclave. There is, I can't say there is a discussion uh, in Ukraine, uh, and uh, the question is, but I, I'll uh, quote what you were writing, that the choice before Kyiv um, is like who should suffer more, the 40 million of Ukrainians in Ukraine who are already paying an extraordinary high price in terms of blood and money for Putin's war, or the 3 million enclavians in the Donbass Bus, who are also paying the extraordinary high price for their misguided support of the separatist adventure. Uh, and my question is, uh, what is different? How you can speak about, you know, democratic state, the state which is supporting the human rights and leaps to the ideas of the Maidan, uh, if you are ready to sacrifice some millions of life for a bit more millions of life? What is the difference of the authoritarian logic with uh, the way you put it in your article? Well, it's a very simple issue. Um, every politics is about the art of the possible. It's not about the art of the ideal. Uh, that's what religion is about. Politics tries to get things done uh, with the greatest benefit for the greatest number. And every political decision you make, not you or not me, but the government makes, involves a trade-off. And it's usually also a choice between the lesser of two evils. I mean, it's really the case that one has to choose between an ideal and its complete opposite. So the choice for Ukraine is very simple. It's a country that, as we know, is virtually, um, is virtually bankrupt, uh, doesn't have the economic resources. It has to embark on extremely complicated systemic reforms in order to become pro-Western and possibly in order to survive. This war is a drain on the economy. It's a war that is dis increasingly making the population unnerved. People aren't happy, they want the war to end. It's clear to me from my conversations and my readings that Ukrainians are increasingly unwilling to die for Luhansk. They're willing to die for Ukraine. I'm not sure they're willing to die for Luhansk and Donetsk. Do you think it's not Ukraine? And what is the difference between? No, no, that's, I'm talking about them. I, I haven't, in my three weeks of conversations, in my reading of blogs, I don't find enthusiasm on the part of the population to go out and die for the Donbass. In other words, my only is point is this. a tragedy of lacking the solidarity? No, no, it's not a, it has nothing to do with solidarity. It's a question about what Ukraine should do in order to prosper and survive as a state. But and the question before Ukraine is really very simple. If, I mean, assuming that it needs to reform, and it needs to reform in order to survive as a state, can it do so while fighting a war that it can't win? And can it do so even if, or especially if, it integrates a region that is led by these militants with 45,000 soldiers armed to the teeth with Russian tanks and the rest. But, Professor, when you speak about that, do you know what are, uh, to your idea, to your knowledge, what are actually the things, what do you mean by blockade? What do you know about the measures which are taken and to whom they are bringing the most harm? Well, unfortunately, people would suffer. 
You're absolutely right. When we're talking about a progressive cutoff of gas, electricity, water, trade, things of that sort, that's what we mean by a blockade, right? So the essentials wouldn't be getting through. Uh, obviously, people would suffer. But Ukraine has to ask itself a question, as does everybody listening or everybody in Ukraine. Is Ukraine in a war? And I think the answer most people would say is yes. Does it want to win the war or minimally not lose the war? And I think most people would say the answer to that is also yes. How can it do that? In a war, in a war, you do not generally, logically, supply the enemy with gas, electricity, fuel, and food supplies. That's just not but done But do you have war. at least one, uh, you know, at least one within this year confirmation that there was a food supply from Ukrainian side which has given, uh, which are going to the, you know, separatists, to the fighters, because following the story very closely, we didn't have any confirmation. The food which were given there, uh, you know, which gets, it gets to the civilians, it gets to the, you know, a, a three million population, why the, uh, the fighters, they usually get their logistics from Russia, so it has a direct impact to the other um, to the other side. So I want to really understand if we are very very general on blockade. How, for instance, the fact that you know that drugs can be given to the hospitals, how they how it can help Ukraine to win the war. You're talking about in order to conduct a war, the terrorists, the separatists, need to have a relatively stable, relatively functioning economy and a relatively stable, relatively functioning society. If the economy and the society begin to degrade, that nev inevitably begins to degrade, subvert, undermine the ability of the terrorists to fight. It is absolutely essential to Ukraine's survival for the terrorists to stop attacking Ukrainian forces. I think we can agree on that. They will not stop doing that. Russia is supplying them with arms. They will only stop doing that if they lack the capacity to do that. And a blockade, or minimally the threat of a blockade, would begin to affect their ability to fight the war. Ukraine will not be able to defeat them. All military experts are in agreement that Ukraine cannot defeat the terrorists. All it can do is stop them. But they, as, you, as we've seen over the last months, they are continually attacking. That can only be degraded if their economic and social base is degraded. If we're speaking long term, are we speaking also about how to live further and if how to live afterwards? So far, what we know, and I, uh, uh, before going, maybe we would show also the piece of the video because we're working a lot in the east. I'm traveling also to the occupied areas, and there is also an idea how we're coming back. So, uh, showing the piece, I also introduced that the, there is a difference. There is some kind of gravity and bitterness with the Kiev, rather more connected to this current events than anything else before. So uh, showing this piece of video, we kind of, we had, uh, I, I filmed in Donetsk, so we, we, we've taken one of many, many, many stories. I really want to connect the things, the general, political, and the human story. На тебя похож. Серьезно похож. Держи. Только не выкидывай, ладно это? А, да, вот этот любитель у нас. Фотографироваться. Да? А сколько им? Полтора вот было. А они оба, да? То есть они... Двойнята. Да? Двойнята, да. Ой, тут за это вам спасибо большое. Мы уже вот с соплями бегаем. Там, смотрите, там что-то вот... Тут это ваше кардио, аспирин. Спасибо. И что-то там Спасибо. еще. А, вот, да. да, да, да. Ну, а младший у нас, он не ходит. У нас проблемы. Ручка не двигается. Не двигается. А, да. Мы только Спасибо. сидеть Спасибо. начали недавно. Еще проблемы у нас повышенной крови в левой части тела. А что с больницей? До Нового года мы туда стабильно ездили каждый месяц. А после Нового года уже, вот в феврале, гололед был сильный. Угу. И страшно было даже выйти на улицу, чтобы не упасть. А потом уже у нас начался ужас. Порошок, зубная паста, мыло такое. Единичное. Спасибо. 
Все, а тебе не надо. Одиночка. Дай мать одиночка. Я рожала для себя. Я знала, что я спокойно их вытяну. Я их подыму. Я хотела второго ребенка, но получилось сразу три. Главное, игрушки ему не интересно. Не, ему мыло надо. Ехать в надежде, что хоть что-то будут платить, а могут и не платить. Оставаться здесь со своими стенами, но вот уже под бомбежкой, без копейки тоже. В общем, не знаем мы, что делать. Не хуже, чем у Пушкина, старуха у разбитого корыта. Что нам делать и куда нам деваться? Хотя бы уже бы не бомбили бы, ставили бы в покое. Не платят, ладно, будем работать. Где сколько заплатят? Сегодня узнали мы, что на Донецке начали давать гуманитарную помощь Макеевским. Но поехать туда, это ужасно. Одна девочка отзвонилась совсем утра, она была там уже 2000 какая-то. Другие приехали к 11, уже четвертая тысяча. Только и регистрация как -то... пошла, да? Да, да. Как там будут обстоять дела, это... А вот вам, если ехать туда, это на чем? Ну... Ой, это самое раньше, не знаю, в 5 утра маршрутка. Также комендантский час. И просто так откатать 30 гривен, они тоже сейчас далеко не лишние, их надо найти. Говорит он, мама. Да. Говорит у нас. Целоваться хочешь? Куй, куй, тебе ток. Отдай баба молоток. Не подожди. Давай, куй, куй, тебе ток. Подай баба молоток. Не подашь молотка, не петку и че петка. Пока, Вова. Пойдем к нам. So, uh, Professor, the idea is, it's a lot also how to live further. You know, when you talk to the people in Donetsk or somewhere else, they definitely, most of them, the majority, don't believe in these crazy things about fascist, junta, and things like that. You know, they probably would be considered as a hostages of the thing, but how to explain the people like that who would suffer from the blockade? Okay, state can't provide, you know, they can't deliver, but uh, creating the troubles for the people, how it would be then explained to the population of the Donbass uh, when we all coming... In in case uh, Ukraine succeed in regaining the region, uh, Ukraine succeed, you know, answering the Russian aggression well, with this message of blockade. Well, you're, you're assuming that Ukraine will succeed in regaining the Donbass. Um, if Ukraine <laughs> succeeds, then the question of how to persuade these people will essentially answer itself. No, 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 but why then how to, you know, f ask for forgiveness then later? If there would be the troubles made, part of the troubles would be considered by the You're assuming, state. again, let me just repeat my no. question to you. Why do you assume that Ukraine will so easily regain the Donbass? It can't defeat the terrorists militarily. It can't defeat Russia militarily or economically. The population of Ukraine is increasingly tired. The Amer Ukrainian economy can't sustain the war effort. How exactly is the war supposed to be won? Uh, clearly, with also the war for the heart of minds and explaining also, you know, we have we are still in the Minsk process. We are still in kind of negotiation of uh, stabilizing, not stabilizing uh, relations with with Russia, but with the at least not having not creating more trouble because the idea of uh, the whole whole operation is about saving the population, is about protecting the population and of I, Ukraine. And here my question to you is very simple. Which population deserves to be protected and saved above all? And my answer to that question is the 40, 45 million people in Ukraine, in Ukraine proper, the one that is controlled by Kiev, deserve priority. And the Ukrainians in the Donbass, the Ukrainians in the Zeleny Klin in the Far East, the Ukrainians in the Kuban, or the Ukrainians in New York are not as much of a priority. What struck me about that film, and it's a very moving film, is that it could have been filmed in any part of Ukraine. When I walk the streets of Kiev, I see babies, I see men and women without legs, without arms, I see paraplegics, I see extreme poverty, 
Um, and there are 40 million people whose lives and livelihoods depend on economic, political, and social reform. The difference is a bit with this particular story that if you speak about the volunteers previously, they could come to, for instance, Mariupol and Kiev and bring back the, the drugs, for, for instance, for this kid. What happening with, the, for instance, problems on the crossing the separation line is uh, oh, look, not uh, getting. But with the answer is, you know, it's not up to me to answer, but if you ask me as a citizen, uh, then I don't see the difference. You know, the idea about the state is to protect a civilian without an arm. So the difference is between the people with the arms who are trying to, you know, commit crime and the population who we are well, all about to, again, you know, save from this war. Unfortunately, if Ukraine were as rich as Switzerland or Germany or the United States, it could do exactly what you're suggesting feed everybody, clothe everybody, provide medical assistance, and as you know, the United States doesn't, but in principle it could, and the rest. But alas, Ukraine is pretty much a third world country, which is barely able to feed itself. And if it doesn't change economically and politically, it won't be able to feed its own population. And the stories that the story you saw that you just showed on that film will then multiply throughout the country itself. I don't see any justice in that. It seems to me that that's actually a very cruel approach because it would mean not only that the country could potentially collapse, but that the lives and livelihoods of 40 million people could become seriously undermined. And we should find this balance between what we are thinking in a great, you know, in general terms, and also when you talk to the people who are there, the volunteers who are providing them, and also the military who are serving and staying in the region where people have broken families and on the daily base uh, discuss that issues. But, you know, thanks a lot. You have the position, you have the point, you have an argument uh, for that, and we were happy to hear that and also stay in touch and discuss further things, how they will move on. My pleasure. All right, now we're going to move in a slightly different direction. Uh, we want to take a closer look at Armenia. So hopefully we'll be joined over the phone by Mamakan uh, Hovispalian, a uh, human rights activist and editor for Electric Yerevan. Uh, Mamakan, can you hear me? I didn't check. We might not have him. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, this looks better. Mamakan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great, excellent. I can hear you as well. So, can you give me give us an update on what's been happening in our, in Yerevan and in Armenia this week with Electric Yerevan? Yeah, so the protests are still going on, and uh, there is a uh, kind of developments now uh, because uh, uh, there are different groups who started public discussions, and those discussions are very useful actually for the movement. And um, there are new people who are involved in the leadership. And um, recently they came up with a new statement that if um, their demands uh, would not be, uh, I mean, if they, they will not have any response from the government, they want to move the party heads one step forward. So mm -hmm. tomorrow, uh, on Monday at 9 o'clock, we are waiting uh, for any response from the government. And what's the situation on the street? I mean, we put up a live feed briefly. It doesn't seem like there are a lot of people on the street right now compared to, say, last week. Uh, is the movement de-escalating, or is it taking a different form? I believe it's uh, taking a different form because uh, at this moment, uh, maybe quality is not the main uh, indicator, but still there is this uh, good and enthusiastic uh, activists uh, who are ready uh, and for the, I mean, for the purpose that they gather. So, uh, well, yeah, number uh, decreased a lot. Before, in the evenings, particularly, we had thousands of people. Now we have several hundred people. Uh, but uh, I, I hope that those public discussions, will, they are really fruitful and they will bring uh, good developments. And is there any sort of a new resolution, or what's being discussed now, particularly in terms of the electricity fees? Uh, the demands are the same uh, regarding the uh, price, the decision, and uh, also to punish for the violence on June 23. Probably, you know, that in the morning, police uh, uh, started brutally uh, abuse uh, activists and uh, journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. 
And uh, Maricon, uh, there was a news about the prosecutors uh, which had launched a criminal investigation into the possible police wrongdoing in the clash. Are people satisfied with that? Do they consider that as a victory? And is it really, what are the chances that it would be really an investigation, a proper investigation? Uh, I think it's, uh, right now it's a bit hard to say whether it's victory or not, but still it's a good uh, step, uh, so the result will be more visible uh, during the procedure, court procedure. Now, one issue that I think has been very interesting for everyone is how this movement has started with one concrete issue, looking at electricity and fees for that, and grown into something much larger. I mean, what are some other causes that have been represented at the protests and that have gained new energy as a result? Actually, it still has the same uh, cause. Uh, just uh, uh, what is good now and what is uh, different now that a lot of women started to participate in discussions before it was, uh, what I noticed, it was a uh, man-only uh, uh, decision-making process, but now a lot of women are involved in the decision-making, but the um, demands are the same, and uh, in this term, nothing has been changed. Everything is connected with the uh, issue that the protest started with. I mean, there are no new demands or uh, nothing else. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us that update. Thank you. And uh, we also, as you know, our correspondent uh, uh, used to work, had been in Armenia following not just the protests, but also trying to go a bit into them. And for this, we also, our, our colleague Nastya Stanko, had met the so-called leaders of the protest. Is a protest without really clear leaders, but probably the most outstanding people of, uh, from the movement. So uh, Nastya had talked to Vaginak Shushanyan, who is 20. 24 years old, and he's co coordinating the movement No to Plunders, and he's already protesting for four years at least, and we talked to him uh, what he has in his mind, what it's all about. So please, we are happy to introduce you the faces of Armenian protest, and you can follow more uh, online. просто хочу, чтобы наша страна был хорошей страной. Я не хочу революцию. Я просто хочу спокойно жить. Это вообще-то началось э, из прошлого года, когда еще подняли цену электричества 4 драма, 10%. Мы тогда бунтули, э, и нам, э, как э, позавчера, сбили полицейские. Мы э, с друзьями начали думать, что можем делать. И в этом году, когда еще раз уже 16 э, драмов по, э, хотели поднять цену, это уже было слишком. Но мы сделали шаги, чтобы это не было. И вот получилось вот это. And uh, one of 
the part of this story, we are following the story closely uh, uh, in Armenia, is also the frozen conflict there, which is in between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in we, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, we'd like to bring a map so you have an idea of uh, this complicated structure of the self-proclaimed states and the in Caucasus. Uh, so um, Nagorno-Karabakh, it's already a dispute which is long for 25 years. And it's an important tool uh, for the geopolitics. You can slice part of land which used to belong to Azerbaijan. Now it's uh, self-proclaimed. The Armenians are living there. Uh, and um, well, it's still claimed. I mean, it's still within the borders of Azerbaijan. They still claim it. And you have this area, this corridor, controlled by the Armenian army going to Nagorno-Karabakh. It's one of the three major frozen conflicts of the South Caucasus. Something that doesn't get a lot of attention, and something we wanted to devote a little more attention to, with this focus on the protests in Yerevan. And we had Anna Nimtsova, the correspondent from the Daily Beast, who. Uh, this week uh, who is working in Nagorno-Karabakh and made her story, so definitely, uh, Anya, we are very uh, happy to see you uh, and uh, are very eager to listen to your story. So what the situation is there, how all these protests which are in uh, Yerevan and other towns of Armenia, what is their impact to Nagorno-Karabakh and vice versa? Uh, hello, Natasha. Very nice to hear you guys. I was working in Armenia last week and earlier this week, I was watching uh, the protests for about three days, three nights. It was interesting. Um, and definitely, as I just heard you guys were discussing, uh, people didn't like to be compared to Maidan. They didn't want that to become a political protest. They called it a social movement. But what we could see that in three days there, that uh, civil society was definitely developing right there, right on that street. And the, the new political power was being born. Uh, people were talking about new parties, political parties, elections, and discussed politics more and more. When I was living, I could see that the few people left on the street were thinking more and talking politics more than in the beginning. So when we drove to Nagorno Karabakh, and the drive is amazing, it takes maybe six hours on a very windy road. It's a good road, but quite windy. And you don't see any gas stations on the way. You don't see uh, much development along the highway. And um, by the end of that trip, you, you wonder how, how does anything get there? And the driver tells me that every little screw, every little piece of furniture comes to Karabakh from Armenia by some different road that takes longer, straighter highway, uh, lots of trucks that bring all the stuff to Nagorno-Karabakh. But when you arrive, what strikes you is that the ground is a pool of people speaking French and English, because diaspora from the United States, from France, from uh, Middle East, they're all coming in summer, and they stay in hotels, the hotels are quite nice, uh, there are a few nice restaurants. Uh, people talk about um, their great democracy. We met with uh, independent journalists, we met with uh, politicians, and Nagorno Karabakh uh, leaves that they, unlike uh, most post Soviet states, uh, managed to cure the main diseases um, dictatorship, corruption, uh, non transparency. So they have a strong opposition in that tiny uh, state, self-proclaimed state that is only a little bit over 150,000 people. And they have a um, uh, prime minister who I met with uh, who told me that he hates he the dictatorship. So, um, well, and what's civil society like there? I mean, have they had, are they kind of behind the times of what's going on in Yerevan now, or do they have a strong civil society themselves? Strong civil society, that's what the opposition would like to have. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a tiny, tiny place. They still would like to develop their civil society. Uh, and complaints that uh, journalists do not criticize the government enough. Uh, they are, of course, uh, following uh, the protests in Yerevan. But uh, there's another side of, of this life in Nagorno Karabakh. Every minute, as people tell me, they think about the war. So the any destabilization, any any political uh, turmoil in, in Armenia.
Armenia uh, make them concerned because people continue to die, people, all men go to, to the military service. I visited a mother on the in a village that is only about 10, 15 kilometers away from the front line. Mm -hmm. She just lost her son, a colonel, and she has no sons left. She's teaching at school, and every school kid knows that one day he will to the military service and to be guarding um, the border. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's really striking, you know, this permanent militarization. But I mean, what is your experience? Because you've been, you know, you've been to the DNR, you've been to LNR, you've been to Abkhazia many times. How does Nagorno-Karabakh compare with those other breakaway regions? Well, as I, as I, as I mentioned to you, it's very politicized. Uh, people talk about democracy because they, they meet with uh, civil society, uh, uh, international civil society. They talk to different groups, international they, they, they um, talk with those with human rights groups. And uh, there is no law like in Russia about uh, foreign agents. Uh, so many groups receive Western grants. They live on Western money. They travel abroad. I, I met with the editor of Radio Liberty, for instance, in Nagorno Karabakh. Hmm. And uh, so people are very well informed about what's going on in the world, although they live in an extremely isolated place, ultimately isolated. Uh, but they, they talk with diaspora, and that's uh, their blessing. They have the world there. The world comes every summer. Armenians love their air, mountain air, they love their land, and they, they travel from all over the world to help Agron Karabakh, those who are. Anya, we've seen uh, this nice and very interesting photo from you, one of many uh, you've done. It's a child drawing at school where there is a word in Russian peace, Mir, and also there is an army, uh, a dubious, uh, a, a, a very kind of a sad implication for that. Uh, but still, uh, there is the international law. You know, it's still a pro-frozen conflict, and Azerbaijan claims uh, that um, it's its territory, and also. It's a tool for geopolitics. There is a lot of talks about selling the weapon, and uh, there is a lot of discussions uh, that either Kremlin sells the weapon to uh, Baku, to the capital of uh, Azerbaijan, or to Armenia. How it's all, um, you know, what's happening now with that, with this, what is the geopolitical impact of uh, current situation in Armenia? So, uh, I, as, as I mentioned, I spoke with the Prime Minister of the Self-Proclaimed uh, Republic of Nagorno Karabakh, who, com who is very sad that Russia is sending strategic weapons to Azerbaijan. And uh, now there is a possibility that there will be $200 million spent uh, by Armenia on weapons, um, $200 million invested by Russia, or given for credit, right? But uh, who decides which kind of weapons? they're going to purchase on that money. That's what people wonder about, and they um, talk about defending Nagorno-Karabakh all the time. That's why we see this drawing. It's a Russian school, actually, where I took a picture, and, uh, uh, and children think about the war. They watch uh, some sort of uh, propaganda shows about the war every week. They know that their fathers went to, to the front lines, that their grandfathers and fathers we're all uh, fighting during the war 20 years ago. In a way, they're stuck in that time. They're stuck in that situation. And um, what is sad to see is that even civil society, even those who go to peace negotiations, they uh, talk of Azerbaijan as of an enemy. And then when you, you, you uh, switch to some personal stories, uh, people remember how they lived together in the same courtyard, how their children were playing in the same courtyard, and that some of them talk on Facebook or in Adnaklasniki, it fell through, uh, with Isaiah friends. But when it comes to geopolitics, when it comes to, to the political questions and questions about the war, they are extremely anti Russian. So a difference between uh, the different borders that you have geopolitically and the ones that people feel uh, through social media and everything else. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Anna. It's very insightful and to get a report out of an area of the world that we don't hear enough of. Take care.
Uh, there is another story we shortly have to pick up. Today is the one uh, year, I'll say, anniversary since the Ukrainian army have recaptured. Uh, Slavyansk, uh, it was the first city really captured. We also can show, yeah, the, uh, you know, this, yeah, th that is a map which uh, explain I mean, us, you know, what is, yeah. Well, it's just worth a bit explaining because we have these two colors. We're trying to show the areas controlled by separatists now versus areas that were controlled previously. The issue, of course, especially when we look a year ago during the summer, there was so much back and forth. You know, looking at the yellow, it's not as if all of those areas were controlled by separatists at one time, but it's to give an impression of the back and forth and the people who've lived under both sides and the rebuilding that has to go on and just how much the front line which has brought in artillery and so much fighting, how that's affected people. But the reason we wanted to talk about that, in addition to the fact that it's an important issue and it's a question of rebuilding, is because, Natalia, you were there for the one-year anniversary of Ukrainians taking back control of the city. So what was that like? Uh, so just uh, to remind us uh, how we how it was a year ago, because I'm just coming back with the train from the area, from, uh, uh, from Slavyansk, and the... Um, and now we can see the video. We've been also there with uh, our cameraman. It was a Mike League also uh, there in the first moment when the Ukrainian army uh, had come to the city, when the fighters, the uh, the, um, the, the pro-Russian rebels, they moved to Donetsk. So there was a huge amount of the weaponry there. There were many people who used to be detained in the, uh, the cellars of the security service building at that moment. And that what we could see and we used to film it one uh, year ago. Uh, but coming there from today, so um, I'll just, b before introducing the short piece uh, we've prepared for you today, what was, m was my idea is just to go to the same families, to the same houses, to the same buildings, to like check what is rebuilt, what is not, uh, how family feels about that, uh, how families of those who had lost their relatives. So generally, um, to be very probably broad, it's definitely a very different atmosphere. You know, everything is working definitely. There is gas, water, Wi-Fi, the free Wi-Fi on the central square. Uh, you know, there are Ukrainian flags and things like that. Uh, but not everything is rebuilt. Um, Especially the biggest trouble is for the people who had a private houses, because people who used to live in the apartment blocks, kind of city could do something for them. It was they received compensation. Yeah, they, they, they did, no, they haven't received the compensation. They were mm -hmm. made up. So, for instance, and also like windows and things like that, they were done mainly by the volunteers, oh, uh, Ukra mm -hmm. Ukrainian repaired by the you know different Protestant groups which we talked. So somehow all the windows which could be you know. Um, changed, they very cha changed, but the difference is, what if you have lost the whole house? If you have lost the whole house, there is not more or less a strategy to build new. You can have a house in somehow in the dormitory, but for elderly people, it's not really something. What is also interesting, so, so there is definitely the lack of this kind of a big funded campaign. Uh, and there is the, the local government, if you speak to the local authorities. So if I can afford to, to say that uh, we, we visited a few of them, uh, they don't really have much money. They don't really have much money for a proper, um, you know, for building the house. They have very little. I can't say that they do nothing. I can't say they are reluctant, but they are really don't have much capacity. And what was, I mean, what was the spirit there? Were people resilient or were they depressed, optimistic? How okay. were they approaching the situation? I, I find it very, uh, I find it very different. You know, you can have, have to the family who doesn't have a house and they would smile and they would be happy that they are, you know, they, 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 they are alive. And there would be people who more or less have everything, but they would complain. Mm -hmm. So it's very personal, but I found a lot of self-organization that people learn how to rebuild things on their mm -hmm. own how to gather with their, you know, neighbors and rebuild their their yard, the backyard, you know, to paint it, to, to find this kind of solidarity in the tragedy. So, uh, and what is probably important to mention, who doesn't know, that uh, there is no nostalgia for 
uh, or any something for, like, say, so-called DNR on the separatists. Mm. If there is something, there is a bitterness that the government doesn't do enough. So there is no sentiment to Russia or things like that. So if there is a bitterness, it could be strong, it differs, it differs, but uh, th th that's how it is. And probably for the figures, we still don't know a particular number of people who had been killed in Slavyansk. Uh, an official number is 56. Uh, there are a lot of people who, that's how many had been registered in this city. It's a city of 1,100 people living, so that's what we know, but it there were many, many myths. So uh, that's something which gives us a bit of understanding what's uh, happening, what was the scale there. But we know there are many, many more towns like that. So shortly for, for that, I'll propose to see this uh, video from the same apartment block which we visited the year, a year ago and have come back. В цьому будинку на вулиці Батюка в Слов'янську ми були рік тому. Тоді тут було вибита частина під'їзду, поруйновано все було. Зараз ми ці наслідки так само бачимо. Ідемо. Тут ходять люди, все-таки пояснили, що без спочатку. Білі в підвал. Хто біл, що біл, це із наших людей ніхто не скаже. Ось, смотрите, це третій етаж. Тут вже все закладено ДСП, частина під'їзду. Це теж е, нова цегла. Кілька нових дверей є. І тут взагалі не було стіни. Можемо також пригадати і нагадати. І відновилося, значить, можна теоретично жити. Вікна нові є. Бачиш, видно, що новенькі. Ми просто повертаємося в ті, в ті самі квартири з мешканками, яких ми говорили рік назад. Не знаємо, чи є хтось вдома, двері нові. Дзвінків тут немає. І ще одна квартира. Як ви, ми бачимо, що щось немного зроблено, там двері встановлені, там стояк якось зроблено. Хто робив і як? І в основному все за свій счет робимо. По мірі поступлення, ну, как, скільки там у нас. Зарплати маленькі, якусь частину кожен місяць виділяємо зарплати і немного за свій счет робимо ремонт. Сказати, щоб хтось нам допомагав, в принципі, ні копійки ми не отримали, ні держави, ні інших організацій таких-то. Все самі. А, ну так, да, там був момент, коли це саме організація благотворительна одна допомогла, ми там поставили двері за їхній счет і окно. Остальное все самі. Це виділили, виділила, ну, я так розумію, місцевий бюджет на під'їзд, на цю ну, зашитшу периметр к зимі, коли к отопленню, от це вони зробили. Да. Окна вставили пластикові, і площадку встановили, полуетаж тут, вона була розрушена. Вот. В принципі, і все, і от це те, що вони зробили, це в тому році ще перед зимою. Okay, and so uh, what is happening these days, um, the I really ask to show it. Um, uh, so we are all discussing the, um, the the Ukrainian social networks are kind of outburst with the photos with the new uh, police uh, coming, uh, and uh, I am not able to do that on my own. So I really ask to show it uh, from the uh, gallery. Uh, so from there is a big story uh, that the new patrol police is working since the uh, since more or less yesterday night. That was the biggest kind of reform for showing off 
uh, if well, we... Yeah, to give it some context, this was yeah. you know, creating a new police to take over for the traffic police. This was a reform that was very popular in Georgia uh, that then they've you know, been working on for a while to bring to Ukraine. Uh, and then yesterday, that was it exploded on social media. They had the swearing in of the different officers. People were taking selfies with the officers in a kind of a New York NYPD style uniform. Uh, and so that erupted on many people here's Facebook pages and on Twitter and uh, we're exposing people to Yeah, that. because there was a lot of bitterness about the Ukrainian police looked, used to look very, very much differently. So uh, for today, we also have this story just by our um, cameraman uh, filming it from our the window. So what the police is doing, you can also show it. So they kind of help the people on the road, which was not very <laughs> usual that the police uh, help the people. Uh, it's usually was vice versa. So when I can remember <laughs> last night, I saw they had TV crews out on the street because they needed footage of the new police officers and the cars at night, you know, getting out and to helping to help people that way. And what everyone, of course, has been noticing is there are more women in the current service than there were previously and many uh, attractive women as well. That's brought in a lot of comments of people asking to be arrested to give them an excuse to interact with the beautiful Ukrainian lady police officers. Uh, but we do have a special guest. We have a New York-based photographer, Misha Friedman, who had an exclude, who had been one of very, very few people who had been following this reform from the first days, from uh, February. Hi, Misha. Hi. Thank you for having me. So you've done the bunch of really great photos, but it's not just about photos. You're a storyteller with your photos. Um, so tell us, how was it? So what, what, why you have chosen this story and what is special with it? Uh, well, you? I first read about it in, de in December when Nekos Goadze was hired to do this, and uh, it became obvious that this is important and this is the key reform for Ukraine. So I decided, I thought it would be a good idea to see it uh, from inside. And so what I've been doing is I've, and more so than then I read that a record number of women applied into the police academy. Hmm. Uh, and I've decided to focus on that because there has never been female traffic policemen in Ukraine ever. Hmm. So the combination of those two things made it obvious. So that's what I've been doing, um, essentially following uh, recruits from the very beginning of, tr of tryouts uh, to training to now um, out in the streets finally today. So uh, we hear, so if you would, we're now following um, Ekas Guladze, who is a Georgian. Um, Ukrainian as a deputy, citizen, no? yeah, currently <laughs> Ukrainian citizen coming from Georgia to do that. How was working with her? I mean, she has a lot of popularity here, obviously. Um, well, the other thing that was obvious, uh, 10 years ago I happened to live in Georgia, when, and I remember seeing what the effect that new police had in Georgia, so... Uh, I what sort of an effect was there in Georgia? Uh, shock and awe, and the entire country just fell in love with the new forest and there were reality TV shows and it was absolutely great and both funny in a very Georgian way and but also I remember how important it was for the society. Uh, working with her was great. She's a, she's a pro. Like she's a, she knows what she's doing and I think Ukraine is very lucky that not not only that she came that she's doing this reform right now but her entire team and, uh, you know, it's not something that her team read in the but they're the same people who did the, the reform in Georgia 10 years ago. So they're applying very direct experience here. To Ukraine. And that's just, uh, you can't get better than that. And did they talk at all about what they had to adapt for Ukraine? Were there differences they had to take into account? Uh, well, the, the, I mean, the, the Kiev is the size of Georgia in terms of population. So it's a lot, I can imagine a lot of things were easier there uh, because everyone knows each other. You could tell by someone's surname where they're from and who their parents are. At the same time, um, I got the impression that they were very impressed with the quality and quantity and the enthusiasm of Ukrainians. 
And maybe you can also explain, we used to show these people on training, so how are your communication with them, who are they? Uh, we know that like youngsters, uh, not the youngsters, we just, you know, that is so present here, that I should explain that somebody says like, or kind of uh, husbands of my classmates went, joined yeah. to the police and all that stuff, so who are these guys, what their motivation? Uh, well, I think their motivation is to, is a combination, of, it's almost 2,000 people, so without getting into psychoanalysis, uh, you get, I, you know, I met all sorts of different characters, but what they do have in common is their desire to live a better life for themselves and for, for the country. They want to be a part of something great. They were definitely motivated by the revolution. Um, and, you know, they, are, they I mainly focused on Kiev, so they want to live in Kiev, they want to live, live a decent life, and they are motivated to try. Were many of them coming from elsewhere to work in Kiev uh, as police officers? Some, no? yeah. Uh, I met people from, Uz from both Uzhgorod and Lugansk, so everywhere. Um, and, but there were a lot of there were a lot of kids who, let's say, were from the provinces, do I say recent graduates in Kiev, maybe a year or two after their graduation and still trying to figure out their careers or lack of, mm. and given also how the, you know, how the economy has shrunk, um, you know, this was kind of a decent way to they saw it as, a, as an opportunity for a decent career. And were there, I mean, you were talking about the women in particular and how that struck you. Were their mm. motivations different or were there, what was that situation Not like? at all. I, I found there, I didn't really get a sense that they were somehow, uh, that their motivation was somehow different uh, or more feminine or, you know, than any other cadets. Yeah. And uh, being an um, American coming from New York, uh, so uh, how did you find it? You know, because there is so lots of excitement here. The uniform looks like the, the ones from the U.S., which is a bit funny for some people. And well, how is for you? In, were they made in the U.S.? Yeah, Someone they were made. Me that, like, yeah, the first part so, of it yeah. had been made uh, because later they would be, you know, copied. And copied, yeah. Okay. So it was I more. Think, I think it's still being made right now. <laughs> <laughs> so the second part's still yeah. to come. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's uh, yeah, you do see, like, American gear, and uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's both uh, funny and kind of great, and well, Were not? there American yeah. trainers as well? There were American trainers. I spent uh, with American trainers from California, uh, from uh, the Eureka, California Police Department, um, and they trained. Their job was to train Ukrainian trainers who would then train others. Uh, others. And I understood that later came uh, police uh, specialists from other uh, parts of the country that then who then focused on uh, uh, basically like more senior staff. But from what I understand, more American trainers are coming to Lviv, to Odessa, and. Uh, I mean, as a, as a New Yorker myself, it's very interesting to watch because all of this is happening at a time yeah. when kind of confidence in the U.S. and the police is probably at a record low because there's been so much violence against African yeah. Americans and, you know, force use that's resulted in deaths and a lack of accountability. At the same time, you know, here in Ukraine now, they're copying these uniforms. They're looking to the U.S. and to the U.S. police as a model of respect or something that can be improved. I mean, that's really interesting. Absolutely. I mean, I was in I was in I was in Krishatia and Krishatia today and uh, that, uh, I mean, there were a lot of people lining up to be photographed with, uh, with you know, with the new police and uh, I don't think they've ever had this many pictures taken of them in their lives as they had today. And, but they, did, they were doing great, uh, you know, they were, uh, they, had a, they still had a smile on, even, you know, later at night. Well, you could so. see people walking around, I mean, letting other people wear their hats, sitting with friends in the yeah. parks. Call it like, yeah, selfie police, what is <laughs> now the mem all over Ukrainian uh, internet. Uh, Misha, within this year, you've been covering many, I mean, you've been covering the stories here for for years. You've been reporting from, um, from Donetsk, from the eastern part of the country, way before it became an international topic. So we've brought some of more of your stories. You've done this 
year, for instance, about the migra about internally displaced people. So we would like to bring them as well about the Jew So maybe you would explain more your stories in Ukraine about yeah, um, their, what we have, yeah? Well, my attitude towards Ukraine was always that it's a country with amazing stories and sadly uh, there was never really any serious interest uh, you know, about Ukraine uh, until the recent events. So now it's, this gave kind of an opportunity to not only do kind of hardcore news, but go a little bit beyond the scenes. So earlier this year, I thought that, you know, I, the way I work is I come up with questions and then I try to answer them with stories. So the two stories I did in, Feb in January were I read about uh, Crimean Tatars uh, moving to to Lviv, and I asked myself, "That's interesting. Like, what's it? So, what is it like to be a Crimean Tatar, you know, living in Lviv?" So, I did a story about that, uh, and then the second story was about uh, Dnipropetrovsk, about the Jewish uh, uh, community there. Um, in Dnipropetrovsk was interesting because there's a I met an absolutely fascinating couple who were uh, displaced a couple from Lugansk. They were Jews in their late 80s uh, who remembered the uh, World War II and they were old enough to remember being moved from Lviv to Uzbekistan in 1941. And uh, so I asked them, like, what's it like? Like, you, this is the second time in your life uh, you were, you, you know, this happened to you. And uh, because they have an absolutely unique perspective. Like, and uh, the response was that even then, you know, moving to Uzbekistan, they understood what the hell was going on. Like, why, why, we're, why this is happening? and the sacrifices they're making and who the enemy was and who, you know, what side they were on. At this time, being, in, you know, 75 years later, uh, moving from Lugansk to Dnipropetrovsk, they, kind of, they don't get it. They don't understand they don't why. Like, well, yeah. Well, yeah, they can't come up with a good answer. Like, what is this all for? Well, and I think that's one of the really challenging thing, things about events in Ukraine is that when you look at the people on both sides, uh, whether often whether it's language or appearance or religion, the differences aren't that big. Um, yeah. And, you know, the reasons, you know, minority groups are always hit the hardest certainly yeah. force people to move around. Um, I mean, I, in the story that you had about the Crimean Tatars, I really loved about that because they moved to Lviv, they were there, and, you know, suddenly they started yeah. serving and selling uh, Crimean Tatar food. Yeah, and I was... Yeah, that's now mm -hmm. we can also, again, because that was also the story of the prisoners of war. Uh, we were showing shortly, you were doing, but now it's really the story about the synagogue in, mm -hmm. uh, in Dnipropetrovsk. And, you know, the rabbi with the... Yeah, the, the, what was... What was great uh, about the Tatars is that I went there expecting to see hardship and conflict and problems. You expect people to be sad and miserable yeah, and, and, and helpless. Thought, yeah. you know, and, and having a hard time adapting because there were never ta you know, Tatars in, in Lviv until, until this year or late last year. And what I found was the complete opposite. Yeah, people were not doing super well, but they were working hard. They were, they were all doing something. They weren't blaming someone else for their problems. They were all ad adjusting to, to Lviv. They've actually found Lviv to be quite comforting, comfortable because they found locals to be a lot more religious than the Russian and Ukrainians mm -hmm. in Crimea. So they kind of, they felt a lot more comfortable about other religion, another religion, religious group than in Crimea, where I think there were more, more, more atheists and- A more secular culture. And more secular. Sure. Uh, and the third thing that was kind of, that was funny was what they, what, where they bonded with the locals, where they both felt like, uh, you know, they had a common enemy. They both, they both had, an, they both could blame Moscow for something that has happened to their peoples in history. Mm -hmm. Both have been either displaced or moved from one empire to another. And there was like, enemy of my enemy is my friend. And well, that's been know. one of the huge shifts. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a time in the 90s when the Ukrainian government had made it difficult for Tatars, Crimean Tatars, who wanted to return from Central Asia. And now, in the wake of Maidan and all of that, you know, Crimean Tatars are seen as the most 
most patriotic of yeah. the patriotic. Yes. Yeah. And uh, there was one also the story um, the people can, you know, Google and find your story about the prison and so forth you were doing. But moving to other, there was some topic you were following a lot. It's about the gay and lesbians, both in Russia and in Crimea. Mm -hmm. So we'll also show some of uh, a few photos of that, so you will tell what is your focus as well. Um, yeah, so I, uh, like in, in the best style of selfish self-promotion, I have a book out that I, that was, that's been, that's now out. That What's the book published. called? Well, the book, it's a book, it's a book about a lesbian couple in St. Petersburg. Their name is Ludmila and Natasha, and that's the title of the book. So mm -hmm. it's a couple that I followed for about three years. So it, it's a love story about two people who just happen to be women, and it's not really directly related to, uh, like, gay propaganda in Russia. This is a story that happened before. Uh, but since, uh, but later, last year, I did a separate uh, magazine feature about a couple in Crimea who uh, have, a, have a son from a surrogate mother, and because of, uh, because Crimea became Russia, they decided that they needed to move, uh, you know, their family Ukraine uh, away from another group of refugees. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what draws you to these groups? I mean, you've done a lot with refugees, you've done a lot with minorities. So here is also, you can see this couple who moved to Kiev currently from Sevastopol. Uh, well, prior to photography, I used to work for Doctors Without Borders. So I still, like that, the approach of that, of that great organization, I, I use it in my photography in choosing my subject matters. So I'm not necessarily interested in, I don't think of them, you know, I'm not a kind of a gay photographer, a war photographer, or a, or a Jewish photographer. I think of vulnerable groups. So I look at news and try to think of, okay, who is the most vulnerable? And uh, so in Crimea, to me, the two clear most vulnerable groups were uh, the LGBT community and the drug users. Um, and th those are the two stories that, because they're different drug laws, Ukrainian laws are much more um, humane and tolerant and European. We mean specifically in terms of the methadone treatment exactly. that people could receive to help them, exactly. you know, so fight addiction. So there are about 800, 800 uh, drug users uh, who, could no longer receive the methadone in uh, Crimea. And uh, so I did a study about that. And, you know, so I tried to think in terms of vulnerable groups and, you know, in each, in each specific case. But that's the way the photo, the, 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 the great story um, of uh, storytelling via photographs. And you definitely, Misha, thanks a lot for explaining us, bringing this, you know, more human uh, story of all what's happening in the region, both in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we are about to over, but you can, you know, find in, in, the, in we are online television, so everybody is online. Watch can, later, share, look at yeah. the video, share everything else, and, and look at Misha's follow photos Twitter, and so his book. <laughs> follow the links and dig more more about the book Misha has and the, all the other stories about, you know, corruption in Russian DNA, what was the project, another p project about the patriotism in Russia, all that is available on online and we are always happy to explain more about what you're doing here. And that's the end of our show. Join us again next week for another edition of The Sunday Show. Good night. Thank you.